Uh, well, first of all, uh, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, Gilson series tonight. Um, the uh, title of our uh, program is uh, The FDA View from DC and Beyond. Uh, my name is Mark Stovakin. I am a licensing manager in the pharmaceutical area at Wharf, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you tonight. And also, for all of you that are in this room, um, I want to in indicate that we also have a, a uh, overflow room, uh, and to all of you who are in the overflow room, uh, welcome. Uh, you will be able to see and hear the presentation uh, in the room. However, you will not have the ability to answer questions or ask questions directly. Uh, so what you will need to do uh, for those of you in the overflow room is to use email if you have access to it, and you can email your questions at the end of the presentations uh, to M. Stovakin at wharf.org. I have my iPhone here and I will put my computer glasses on and try to read from this small device uh, your questions and I'll re relay those on to the uh, moderator and our speakers. Um, so this is the, uh, the final Gilson event for the, uh, for the season and uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to present uh, uh, an installment of Wharf's uh, long-running Gilson lecture series. A little bit about this series, it began in 2004 with a, a gift from the late Dr. Warren Gilson. Uh, Dr. Gilson was a UW Medical School graduate, a faculty member, and a prolific uh, inventor of medical electronics and instruments. Uh, he was also an entrepreneur uh, and founder of Gilson Incorporated, a leading manufacturer of analytical instruments, uh, headquartered in Middleton. Uh, Dr. Gilson often uh, recollected that as a young entrepreneur, uh, he valued the informal conversations he had with his colleagues in the cafeteria of the university hospital. Uh, and with each event that we hold, we hope to recreate some of that vibrant dialogue between business and the university. Uh, and each Gilson event uh, is concluded with a network, uh, networking reception uh, that follows yeah, outside in the, uh, in the lobby here, and we'll offer food and drink and uh, a chance for you to uh, uh, carry on conversations with our uh, presenters and moderators and amongst yourselves. Um, the uh, bootstrapping series uh, that we put on is uh, very much in the spirit of Gilson's vision for what Wharf could do uh, with uh, this incredibly generous gift from Dr. Gilson. Uh, partners uh, in delivering the series include the UW-Madison Schools of Business and Law, the Office of Corporate Relations, the UW-Madison Small Business Development Center, BioForward, and the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. Representatives from each of these groups are with us this evening and will be available for conversation during the networking reception that follows. Um, and um, over the course of this academic year, the Gilson boot Bootstrapping Series has featured lectures and discussions on emerging and nimble practices in creating new ventures. Our goal has been to bring together speakers who themselves are innovators and in how they approach challenges uh, in the rapidly changing technology sector. Uh, we conclude this year's presentation with the panel discussion on new and emerging practices and challenges in working with the Food and Drug Administration uh, as well, we will discover over the next hour um, how the FDA presides over one of the most dynamic uh, purviews of any government agency and sits at the intersection of ethics, economics, technology, and regulation. Uh, understanding the complexity of its task is a necessary and often overlooked uh, precursor to fulfilling the potential of many impactful discoveries uh, aimed at improving human health and well-being. Uh, so here to uh, introduce this panel uh, and to moderate uh, the discussion uh, is Brian Rank. Uh, Brian, if you'd stand up. Brian is the uh, executive director of BioForward. Uh, BioForward is the member-driven state association uh, that is uh, uh, the voice of Wisconsin's bioscience industry. Uh, Brian has also been at the helm of BioForward for more than three years and was prior to that president of AOVA Technologies. He brings more than 25 years of leadership experience in biotechnology, technology transfer, and business development to BioForward, and is one of the, one of the state's chief advocates for its biotechnology and uh, medical devices industries. 
So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brian Rank. Well, welcome once again. Um, I guess I get to do the heavy lifting of moderating the panel, which shouldn't be too difficult because you've got a great uh, set of speakers here this evening. Um, and I got to say, for me, this is really timely. I'm going to go to uh, D.C. bright and early tomorrow morning at 6.30 to um, lobby on behalf of Wisconsin and hopefully the rest of the life science industry to continue to push for the uh, uh, user fee reauthorization for uh, PADUFA and MADUFA, which I think you'll hear a little bit about tonight at uh, it's tonight's panel. So first, I'm gonna, uh, I get the pleasure of introducing Alta Charo. She's our first speaker tonight. She's the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at the University of Wisconsin Law School. And she's the Warren P. Knowles Professor of Law and Bioethics at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where she's on the faculty of the law school, and also the Department of Medical History and Bioethics at the med school. She also serves on the faculty of the university, uh, university's Master's in Biotech Studies program, and lectures in the MPH program for the Department of Population and Health Sciences. Alta served on the uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Obama's uh, transition team, and was on leave from 2009 to 2011 to serve as a senior policy advisor on emerging technology issues in the office of the commissioner of the FDA. Please welcome Alta Charo. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I should let you know that I ordinarily would teach a course that lasts for 14 weeks on the Food and Drug Administration, and they've given me 10 to 12 minutes now to tell you everything you need to know about the FDA. Um, and so for that, I've got two slides, which I will try to keep to within our time limit. Um, there are, I imagine, some of you who are not completely familiar with the order of events for a product approval at the FDA. And since the FDA actually regulates about 25 cents of every consumer dollar in the U.S. in the form of cosmetics and foods and medical devices and biologics and drugs, it seemed to be a little bit too much to handle in 10 minutes, so I'm going to focus only on drugs. And I know that the next speaker is going to be focusing on medical devices. That'll give you a nice uh, range of examples. Um, for drug approvals, and I'm just going to run through this so that we can then talk about the choke points, uh, there's a kind of classic series of events. This is highly stylized and simplified. Basically, we start with basic and preclinical research. It's your laboratory research, your research in animals that are not humans. And at the end of that period of time, typically you'd approach the FDA for what is called an investigational new drug uh, exemption. Basically, you're not allowed to market a drug in the United States if it has not been approved by the FDA. And so in order to start giving it to people, you have to get an exemption from that prohibition, and that's what the investigational new drug exemption is about. And to get that, the FDA is going to ask you to show all of your preclinical research that gives them an idea about your degree of confidence in the likelihood of benefit and the likelihood of specific kinds of risks in the human population when you actually start your studies. Um, one of the real problems, and I'll talk about this in a moment, has to do with how it is that you generate that kind of data since you are working with non-human animals, and clearly your experience cannot be completely generalizable. Uh, the next step is going to be a series of phase one studies, which in some of the more classic uh, formulations is really a set of studies that focus on toxicity and metabolism. Just find out when you take this drug in tiny amounts, uh, how does your body metabolize it? How does it excrete it? How long does it take? Uh, are there any toxic side effects? This is typically done with healthy volunteers, except in uh, certain uh, exceptional kinds of scenarios, such as cancer studies. And it is usually done with extremely small numbers of people. So you'll occasionally see signs around here, particularly on the West Campus, looking for healthy human volunteers, almost always males, between the ages of, let's say, 21 and 45, uh, to come and test a substance that's never been tested in humans before. Lots of interesting ethical questions about how it is that you ask somebody to do that. But on the other hand, we also hire people to do many other kinds of risky things in this world. Uh, no, I mean, a very serious ethical question from how you recruit people. Uh, next, phase two studies, you continue looking at toxicity and metabolism, but now you're also beginning to test dosing, and you're probably beginning to take the very first look at the possibilities of efficacy. It'll vary from drug to drug. In fact, in certain classes of drugs, there's some suggestion that if you see effectiveness at this stage, there's an excellent chance you'll see it all the way through to the end of the trial, but again, that's only a subset of the drug studies. Uh, that tends to be in the 
tens, maybe 100 people. We're not talking huge numbers yet. It's when you get to phase three studies that you're getting to the huge numbers. Those of you that have seen ads, uh, do you have asthma? Come and sign up for a trial of a new asthma medication, or do you have depression? Those are usually ads for phase three trials. Those are typically much larger scale. They may be hundreds or even thousands of people. Could be at one center or 15 centers around the country in an attempt to gain some, uh, some diversity in the underlying population that you're testing upon. You're looking now both to see whether or not this drug works. We, you know, it will cure the disease or it will ameliorate the symptoms. And you're also looking for the kind and frequency of the side effects. Uh, does it seem to create, does it cause nausea? Does it cause headaches? Uh, are people suddenly dropping dead from blood clots? These are the kinds of things that you're looking for. Phase three studies go on for quite a while and it can be an iterative process going back to the FDA with your results and being asked to do additional studies, which is what the next slide will be about. Um, but finally, you go and you have a new drug approval request to the FDA, which will be the moment at which finally the so-called label is designed. That's the, not the little thing you get on the bottle from the pharmacy, but that is the much more extensive piece of information that outlines all of the underlying research, outlines what's known about the benefits and risks and about the dosing, outlines what are considered to be the contraindications and the indications for that particular drug. And once approved, you can then market that approved drug for the indication for which you had tested it and gotten approval from the FDA. Doctors are free to prescribe it for other purposes, but you, the sponsor, are not allowed to market it for other purposes. In fact, the fact that you <clears throat> can't market it for other purposes is the stick that the FDA uses to get you to come in with new data to prove that the other purposes are safe. Anybody who does that will get an exclusive opportunity to market and presumably some market advantage. And then finally, there is an ongoing process of what we call post-market surveillance. Once the drugs are out there, there's a process for collecting information about how they are operating in the real world, in people's bodies, when they're also taking other drugs, when they're of different ages, uh, different ethnicities, different dietary habits than those who were in the underlying trials. Uh, whoops, wrong direction. Um, that is a system that looks terribly logical on its face, but it's actually a very recursive and iterative system and can be very frustrating for companies because there are some irreducible challenges in trying to move a product from experimental to approved uh, because you're always balancing your goal of getting effective medications to the people who need them with your goal of not hurting people for whom the medication is inappropriate. And sometimes it's simply impossible to know which people are going to be which. So let me start with the, this very short list of choke points. The first is the uh, investigational new drug exemption, the first time you go to the FDA and ask to test in humans. At this point, there are often fundamental scientific uncertainties that are going to make it very hard for the agency to know when it's safe enough to go into a human. So if you, the company, want to start, and you're waiting for the agency to give you a yay or nay, they don't know on what basis. So in the area of stem cell therapy, to take an example close to home, there were underlying questions about whether or not you needed to be able to be absolutely sure there was not a single cell that was so undifferentiated that it might begin to differentiate in unexpected and potentially harmful fashion. So there were questions about how many cells in that undifferentiated state could be tolerated in a therapeutic intervention, and how would you detect that? How would you be sure when you got down to that minimal number? This was a fundamental question of what we would call regulatory science. It may not be a fundamentally interesting question for scientists, so it may not be something they're out there exploring, but from a regulatory purpose, you need to know these things because they are tools by which the agency can then act on your application. And there is now a big push for, invest for investment in regulatory science by the NIH and the FDA, but it is still far behind what we need. Uh, those of you that follow these things will notice that finally, finally yesterday, um, the uh, first of the guidances on nanotechnology in food and cosmetics came out. These are draft guidances for comment. This is an example of a field, too, where the fundamental uncertainties about how nano-sized particles will operate in different contexts meant that it was very hard to figure out what would be the appropriate regulatory pathway and how, once you did decide if it needs pre-market review or not, how you would do that review. Next, phase three studies. These are those large studies I was talking about, multi-center, thousands of people. 
The trouble here is that what you really like to be able to get is a good picture of the overall benefits and risks of a drug. But often there are going to be risks that will um, result in adverse events that are so rare that it's completely unreasonable to expect you're going to pick it up in your clinical trials unless you were to have 100,000 people, which is clearly going to be financially uh, non-feasible. The second problem is that some drugs are going to cause a slight uptick in an otherwise common condition, and that's extremely hard to pick up, whether before or after approval. Vioxx, for example, was a drug that was being prescribed primarily to a population of people who are older and therefore already somewhat prone to heart disease and heart attacks. So it took a long time to figure out if Vioxx was going to be, was responsible for what seemed to be an uptick in that kind of problem or if it was one of the many other possible variables, environment, exercise, culture, diet. Very hard to do this and almost impossible to do it in a phase three study. But having seen heart disease in particular come up a few times now, especially most recently in some diabetes drugs, you, I've been hearing from the uh, business side that at least in the world of diabetes research, there's been a real reluctance to invest because of the fear that the FDA is simply not going to be able to approve something because they can't figure out beforehand if it's going to cause heart disease and they don't want to let it out not knowing for sure so that it just creates a kind of choke point. Uh, third, I'm running out of time, uh, the new drug approvals. There are values conflicts, not only between, let's say, the sponsor and the agency, but even within the agency about when you have reached that appropriate benefit to risk balance that would justify bringing a drug onto the market. Um, one of the value, just as an example, one of these values conflicts may be if a drug is really about relieving symptoms, but it has a, a very small but nonetheless measurable risk of death. Is it by definition not possible to say that the benefits outweigh the risks? How do you measure many, many people with mild symptom relief against one very unusual person who actually dies? And this is a very real problem. It came up with a pediatric asthma drug where it was really about helping kids to sleep through the night more effectively, but there were some kids who were going to probably die. And there was a huge conflict inside the agency that took quite a long time to resolve because there was no actual objective scientific algorithmic answer to that. It's a value judgment. And it's also a question about who gets to make the value judgment, the physician, the patient, the agency, or some combination. Second example, very briefly, is there a value in having yet another version of a drug on the market? If you've got six drugs that already treat, let's say, treat um, diabetes, and there's a seventh drug that does not show any obvious advantages or disadvantages as compared to the current drugs for any particular population. Is there any benefit in putting that drug on the market? Because the drug will have some risks. Every drug does. And again, fundamental differences within the agency between those who think expanding options for physicians is always a good thing versus those who think unless you can show that somehow it's better than what we've got for at least one person out there, it shouldn't be approved. Again, unresolved and therefore can be a choke point as inside the agency they're spinning and spinning and spinning trying to react to your NDA. Last, post-marketing surveillance. Post-marketing surveillance consists of data that is fundamentally dirty data. It is anecdotal reports that are coming into the agency from individuals who have chosen to tell their physicians and the physician chose to then tell the agency or to the drug company and the drug company reveals it. It may be studies that academics are doing, but the studies are of course not exactly the same as the studies that were used originally, so the underlying populations are a little different, the controls are a little different, the dosing's a little different. So what'll happen is the agency begins to get a little signal that maybe there's a problem, but they're not sure. And the question of at what point you actually intervene and ask for something from the company, whether it's to run a phase four study or to put a new warning on a label or to implement a new surveillance program specifically for people who are taking that drug, um, this is a judgment call. And again, the conflict over what, at what point is your certainty about the signal high enough to justify any of these requests, many of which could be very expensive to a company and which company may resist. Again, not an easy, not, it's not something that has an algorithmic answer. And then by way of conclusion, I just want to note 
that the agency is one that historically has been whipsawed over and over. There were periods of time where the agency was being celebrated for how slow and conservative it was. When thalidomide caused all those birth defects around the world back in the 1950s, but not in the United States because one person at the FDA was unconvinced by the data that had been submitted, the United States would crow that we have the most conservative agency in the world It makes for the safest drug supply, and we became, in fact, a gold standard drug approval agency for the world, which, in fact, we still are to a very, very large extent. But at the same time, in the 1980s, when President Reagan was in office and we were beginning to talk about economic competitiveness, and we'd had the experience in the 70s with people going uh, out to Mexico and other places for cancer therapies that had not been approved, we began to see pressure to approve more quickly both from patient populations and from the business community. And then, having then worked to just make it possible to move things out a little bit more quickly, we have things like Viox and Avandia and other kinds of high profile uh, uh, press coverage of drugs that are now suspected to have caused problems that weren't worth it uh, in terms of the benefits they offer, you get another set of pressures now to slow down. And I am not exaggerating when I tell you that we can probably show you several times where Congress held hearings within the same week, one to complain that FDA was too fast and the other one to complain that it was too slow. So as an agency, basically uh, somebody who was just there only in the last couple of years and so I still feel like it's a we rather than they, I'm begging you, have mercy on us. Thank you. Thanks, Alta. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have the presenters give uh, their presentations and then we'll have questions later. So uh, obviously we've, we've stressed them a little bit because we're trying to have them give a lot of information in 10 to 12 minutes uh, for this uh, presentation. So next up is uh, Daniel Blank. He uh, leads the regulatory affairs for Vital Images, a division of Toshiba Medical Systems that makes advanced visualization software. He's also had a variety of leadership roles with GE Healthcare, uh, Daniel earned his JD at the University of Wisconsin, a Master's of Engineering at the University of Illinois Chicago, and a Bachelor's of Science in en Electrical Engineering from Valparaiso University. He's a licensed professional engineer and regulatory affairs certified by the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. Please welcome Daniel Blank. So I'm going to cover the other side with medical devices. And uh, this will just be an overview of some of the basic rules and requirements so you can understand the complexity of medical devices and know for certain that you need to hire David. <laughs> okay, the first step with medical devices is knowing what do you need to do because the requirements change depending on your device and depending on how you want to sell it. What clinical use do you want to promote uh, for your device? So the very first step in this process is first defining the product, defining what clinical uses you want to go after and what technology will make up your device. Is it electronic? Is it going to be uh, in the patient vicinity? Is it going to be just something the physician holds? And that will change how the FDA will regulate your device. And there are basically four outcomes for that. There is, it's not a medical device, and that would be, mean that it's not going to be used to treat or diagnose people. Uh, there's class one, which then you, uh, you just register your site, include the device on a list, and you're done. You could probably finish that uh, before the end of this lecture. Uh, then there's class two, which is the 510K, and the most common way that you need to get your device through the FDA. And then there's pre-market approval, which goes with class three devices. And all devices that are not classified are automatically class three, which means you actually have to prove that it's safe and effective, which means that it works and it won't hurt people. So in the US, it's very, it's very much like a telephone book. There's a classification regulations, and you go and look up inside that book, there's MRI system, CT scanner, ultrasound. And you try to find the device that best fits the description uh, of what you're trying to make. Uh, below that, there's another layer, it's called the product code, and that's a, an innovation of FDA internally, and what means that the classification regulations took too long to make, so essentially they devised this next layer of product codes, which means that within a classification regulation you might have different product codes. And all that, you keep trying to find the bin that your device fits in and your use until you get to the end classification. What do I need to do? 
list, 510K, or PMA. And there's a, a sort of a fourth thing there, and I include it here just because it's becoming very important, and that's the idea of this de novo review, which means basically all unknown devices start out as class three, means you have to go PMA, but FDA realizes that some devices look very similar to existing devices, even though there wasn't something else to compare it to. Um, the, for those, you can then, if you're initially class three, go through this de novo process. And this is, in proposed guidance and things, might actually become almost a fourth classification where you go through a classification stage and then you go file your 510K. So that's, that's the basic framework. Just on the 510K I didn't go through is that the 510K is based on substantial equivalence, which means you're always trying to show that this device is as similar to a past device that already exists which is very different for innovators and entrepreneurs who are, who are more used to the patent system. We're always trying to explain why your device is so different. So after you've gone to the patent office to get your patent and tell them it's absolutely different from anything that's ever been done before, you go to the FDA and tell them it's exactly the same. It's nothing new. Okay. So I have, I have three small children at home, which means we watch a lot of animated movies. And so one of the classics, uh, It's a Bug's Life. Okay, the Flick, the main character, takes out a rock and tries to explain throughout the, the movie, it becomes a running joke, that really it's a seed and seeds grow out, come out, uh, trees come out of the seeds and one day to the young princess uh, that she'll be uh, coming to her full self. And, uh, and throughout the movie, they're going, it's just a rock. But uh, I thought that, uh, being with my children, that that would make a good example for FDA regulations. Uh, but just to show out uh, how you have to classify a product, it's not necessarily how different the technology is. It, a lot of it depends on what use you want to pursue. This becomes a very important idea. And it's very hard as a regulatory person to communicate just how important it is. It doesn't matter what the device does. And I'm an engineer, I love that conversation. But I need to understand what clinically do you want to pursue. So a rock could have lots of intended uses. One is the, the pet rock. This is from 1975, Gary Dahl, he sold about 1.5 million pet rocks for $3.95 each. But an amazing marketing ploy to put a, a, a rock in a box. And the real product, in this case, was the manual where he added some jokes and things about this rock as a pet. So if you had a rock and you had a patent for it, you could sell it as a pet rock. If you had a rock, you could sell it also as a handheld device to compress tissue during surgery. I think a rock would work for that. If you had a rock, you could also use it as a mechanical stimulus device to evoke a patient response. Another possibility for a rock. And the last one, you can have a cranial mechanical stimulator applied to the patient's head to relieve insomnia. I think we can all imagine how that might work. <laughs> but uh, before I move on, I have to start thinking, what would be different about these four products? What would, what would Dahl have to change about his pet rock? What, what, would, what else would we put inside the box? The manual. Only the manual changes. He could ship the same rock in the same box with a different manual for these three different other uses and that would change what the device was. So that's my in intended use example. So to continue with the rock, let's, uh, let's classify the rock. Now, I went through the, the phone book of FDA regulations to see if we could classify the rocks and how we might get them registered with the FDA. So having done this in advance, the pet rock is not a medical device, and you can sell that right now without, without registering with the FDA. Very simple. Uh, the handheld device, handheld device to compress tissue during orthopedic surgery is actually a class one device. So under product code HWN, uh, I cut out the language there because there's actually a long list of handheld devices, but one of them is a, a device used to compress tissue. So in that case, we'd have to register our facility, we'd have to list that we're selling rocks to compress tissue, and, and we would be done with the FDA. Uh, the, the mechanical stimulus device to invoke a patient response, it's class two. 
under the 1880 mechanical stimulator, product code GZP. And this fits perfectly. I was, I was, I was pleased to find that. So no creative regulatory work there. Uh, the, the, the fourth one is the hardest because there actually is not a mechanical stimulator to apply to a patient's head to, in, to treat insomnia. So it's automatically class three. It's not classified. Now, I did, however, find and, and model this after the electrical one, which is class three as well. So my guess is if we were to approach FDA with this rock that's used to treat insomnia, that they would also classify it as class three. So basically, the, the message is the intended use and what it's clinically good for drives the classification. But it's also interesting about this, especially for entrepreneurial companies, is that your product might have multiple uses, and some revenue streams are easier to get to than others. You might be able to sell your rock as a pet rock, or you might be able to sell it as a compression device, and over time, build up the data you need to go after the more creative uh, clinical uses. And that's usually a lot of the decisions. It's like, can we restrain ourselves enough from that final big use in order to, to you know, slowly go after and build the evidence? Because it, the it's always the temptation to, to leapfrog, and, but usually from a regulatory standpoint, it's better to at least get something and have access to the market. Okay, so once you figure out what you are, class one, class two, class three, uh, there are certain requirements that you need to follow. Everyone has to follow quality system regulations. And I would personally emphasize design controls. Uh, this is something that uh, having worked with taking devices into a large company is very uh, difficult to communicate what exactly design controls would mean, but it's essential to, to knowing what that device is, how it's defined, and how you're going to test that device. Um, also, design controls are required for clinical studies. So if you intend to actually go gather data on your device to go get a 510K or go get a PMA, you need something in place to, to say, how are we going to document our design and ensure that it's completely tested? Uh, another point, because I've seen it done in various ways, but I recommend keeping one set of books. And when I say books, I mean the design files that, are, that support what the device is and does. Um, it's one thing to develop a, pr a process that lets you get a product tested in your laboratory, but it's another thing to make sure that's also producing the same things and data that you need in order to go to the FDA. So research that beforehand and build it into the data plan that, of your development. Uh, the other thing that uh, is sometimes uh, not as easy to grasp as this data strategy. And that is always try to get evidence at the, the cheapest way you can. I, and I outlined six, and these are pretty much the big buckets I think. If you can do modeling, which means you do something on a computer, you prove that it's the same as something else, it's all in software, MATLAB, very common. Bench testing, where you actually are taking measurements on your bench on the device, uh, it's the same thing as verification. That, that is very, is relatively inexpensive data. Usually you can do that if you can design the product, you can also test it yourself. Uh, third party certification is one I think it gets missed a lot in innovative settings, but there are industry standards out there that can, you can certify a product to. Electrical safety is one of the most basic ones. Uh, biocompatibility is another very common one. You don't have to reinvent the wheel on what it, makes, what it takes to make a device safe. You can go and test these standards and the point is proven and you don't have to try to prove those points to the FDA. All you should, but your, your goal is to make sure, minimize the gaps of new information. Use the, the less expensive data to prove those things that everyone understands and just get down, get down to the open questions. And finally, you get um, the other pieces to, to fill in then those open questions are clinical data, which I would say is non-statistical clinical data, example testing, things where like you just run it with one doctor, maybe not in clinical care, but uh, on old data or something. That's, it's sort of like a clinical study and the requirements that apply to it, but it's not really a clinical study and that's not statistical. Uh, then there's animal testing, which is, is expensive as well, and clinical studies, which are the most expensive, but also the most powerful if you can prove something. Uh, working with FDA, there are generally two strategies. One is I call it radio silence, where you do not talk to FDA unless you have to. Um, this, is a, this is usually a, a strategy where you're, if you're worried about something. Um, but you need only basis, always formal. Um, also, a lot of, large organizations, this makes sense sometimes because you don't want too many different people that are making up sort of the brand image of your company to FDA. 
Uh, the other approach I call it interactive or more like uh, treating the FDA almost like another customer. Or you, you want to, anytime you can, seek an opportunity to communicate or interact with them, going to the meetings where your reviewers are at, going to the meetings that, that the leadership is at, and asking intelligent questions, or, or commenting on the guidances that come out. And those are just every opportunity you can to show that you're a trustworthy person, and, uh, and then only going to formal communication when it's required. Like, you have to submit your 510K in writing. You can't call up the reviewer and ask him to think about your device and have him write you a letter. So, that, that's another approach. That is actually getting more difficult to do uh, because, the, at least from the reviewer's perspective, I've heard that they have a lot more uh, documentation to fill out if you call them informally. So uh, that might be a, a change that's happened over the last year or two that, that will affect how much you can interact with them. Uh, on regulatory affairs, again, if, if you're a single person, you probably don't want to do all of this, but I think regulatory affairs really is your marketing and sales to government authorities. You know, marketing, you have to know what the customer wants, you have to know what the regulators want. You have to speak to them in their language, you have to understand their concerns, and you have to answer them in the terms that they understand. Um, so, uh, and just like sales, you have to be ready to, to promote your product. Those things that are good that you have done throughout the product development process, make sure you're, they're really obvious for the FDA to find. Those things that are not so good, you can't hide them, but uh, you can be ready with answers and be prepared, and it shouldn't be a surprise where those questions are. And you always want to get the product approved or cleared for what it is and not what FDA might mistake it to be. So, yeah, no surprises. And keeping current is another piece of regulatory affairs intelligence and another piece where you probably want to get help. Uh, there's just so much information. FDA has, I am on daily emails. I weekly go to the website to poke around on enforcement actions. There's industry associations. Find one that is near your product, depending on where your product is falls in the spectrum. Midas is a very common one. Advamed isn't very specific, but at least it gives you a good news stream. Um, NEMA. There's professional associations, BioForward. Yeah, he didn't even tell me that beforehand that he was going to be here. So uh, RAPS, uh, Life Science Alley in Minnesota is a big one, but they have lots of streams of information and also people you can get a hold of uh, for interesting issues. Other things, the more unconventional ones, LinkedIn groups I found valuable, Times, Google Alerts, and then there's the conventional law firms and consultants. We can go to their websites. Amerigo has good global stuff. If you want to go, they have country summaries. And I just to put a plug into to more difficult internationally, it's very hard because there's, this is one FDA, and, and I might spend 25% of my time on, on FDA. Uh, but there's, I track 60 other countries, me and, me and people in my department. But uh, it's a lot. There, these things are always changing. So it's basically on a weekly basis, there's some group of countries that need to be reviewed for what requirements have changed. Uh, so that's, that's medical devices here in the US. And if you have questions about international stuff, I'd like the comparison too. So thanks. Thanks, Daniel. OK, batting cleanup is uh, David Rosen. He's a partner at Foley and Lardner. Uh, he's the co-chair of the life science industry team at Foley. Uh, prior to any private practice, David spent 14 years at the FDA in various supervisory positions involving virtually all aspects of the drug approval process, combination products, jurisdictional issues, and related compliance activity. He earned his JD at the Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law, and also holds a bachelor's of science degree from the University of Connecticut School of Pharmacy. Please welcome David Rosen. <laughs> Let me see if I can uh, work this. Ah, here we go, great. So um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. It, I flew out from Washington this morning. Uh, it's the first time I've been in Madison, so thank you for ordering up a lovely day. When we first talked about this, I said the condition I told Ann Smith and Eric England was that it was fine to do as long as it wasn't in the middle of winter time, so. Um, and uh, you, you uh, um, Brian, uh, uh, told me that, uh, that um, you know, I'm a husky, but I'm, I think I've adopted the badger today, okay? So if you'll welcome me as a badger, I would be honored to be a part of the badger today. So thank you. So um, I bring you greetings from Washington. It's really pretty there, too. So come in and see everything. The cherry blossoms are done. They, they, you know, everything has a little earlier springtime here in, in D.C. So 
Uh, but the new memorial down in the, the center, the Martin Luther King Memorial, is very impressive. I had some uh, cousins come in the other night, and um, we saw the memorials at night, and it was just really beautiful and just gorgeous. So, greetings from uh, Washington, D.C. I also, I have to compliment my, uh, my two other previous speakers here, too, because what they did in 15 or 20 minutes, you know, only took me about 33 years to figure out. So, you guys are all experts. I think I should give a quiz and something like that. I'm in the student lecture series, you know, but maybe we'll wait for afterwards, so. Um, the president also sent his regards, too. <laughs> so, very important to, to know the, the people. The uh, people on the bottom row are people you really ought to know, though. Uh, in the center is uh, Dr. Margaret Hamburg. She's the Commissioner of Food and Drug. On the right is Kathleen Zabalius. She's the head of uh, Health and Human Services. And on the left is uh, John Taylor, and he's a, a deputy commissioner, uh, and really one of the right-hand people to Commissioner Hamburg. And interesting, um, John comes from a, a, a long tradition of food and drug family. I worked with his dad, and his dad was one of the uh, chief enforcement officers uh, at FDA, and very well respected. And John and I spent time in the general counsel's office when we were both in law school, so it's kind of nice to see him like really rising up. He was also an executive at Bio, too, so very nice. Um, the president's dog also said hello. <laughs> And, you know, if I talk about the president's dog, you know, my dog gets really pissed off, so I have to put his picture in here, too, so. So, um, you heard about everything that's going on at the FDA, and then, you know, the question is, you know, when do you seek outside help? And that's kind of what I'm here for, you know. It's expensive, and it's expensive for startups, and when you should, when should, when you should use us. So, um, sorry, I have a few uh, props I have to grab, too, you know. I apologize, so. If you've got a big headache, you need a big t uh, t uh, capsule. It might be a tough to swallow, but you know, you've got uh, big medicine to, uh, to try to help you out. So you heard a lot about uh, who has jurisdiction over my product. We heard a little bit about the Center for Drugs, and you heard about INDs, and 505B1 applications, and 505B2s, and 505Js. I like to talk in synonyms and, and things like that. So at Alta, you're, you're, you're a woman after my own heart. She can talk as fast as I can talk. It's really great, you know? So uh, <laughs> there's the Center for Biologics, so deal with stem cells and things like that, sort of biological products. You've got the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, CDRH. We talked about IDEs, 510Ks, PMAs, de novo reviews. We've got foods, dietary supplements, cosmetics, and things of that sort, and uh, Center for Tobacco Products, too. FDA now has jurisdiction over tobacco products and constituents of tobacco. So, And then the question is, you know, does the product cross product lines? Is it a, not a, does it have elements of the, uh, is it a drug device combination or biologics device, or device combination? And if so, who has jurisdiction over the product? So you really have to understand where does your product fit in the scheme of things? And that's not easy to figure out at times, because you're looking at what is the primary mode, in t uh, primary mode of action, and that's really the, the way we look at or evaluate uh, jurisdictional issues if it's uh, between a drug and device. So you have to think about what kind of services do I need, you know? Um, in your stage, in early stage companies, uh, intellectual property uh, protection is very important. And then, you know, do you need outside experts? You know, what, what kind of products do you have? Do I, you know, do you need a formulation expert? Do you need methods development, process development, farm talks, pharmacokinetics, microbiology, software engineering, verification, validation, things of that sort? All part of what uh, Dan talked about uh, in terms of verification, validation, quality systems requirements, current good manufacturing practices, and things of that sort. All things that you really have to take seriously because we're putting products into patients. We cannot subject patients to an unreasonable risk of harm through the investigational process. We have a responsibility and an obligation to protect patients. Do you have a development plan? What kind of data have we generated to date? You know, and you know, should we go talk to FDA before we expend a lot of money? I mean, that's a really good question. And do you have a, a legal or regulatory issue? Trying to define what the scope of the issues are that you have. So, when you work with outside people, you know, and, you know, and so you pick up the uh, hotline, okay, you know, your hotline, and you want to know who's going to answer this hotline, okay, you know, um, uh, are they accessible? You know, I answer my own telephone. If you call me, you get me. You don't get my secretary. You don't get a young associate. You don't get anybody else. You want to talk to me. I'll talk to you. You know, you got to find out when I, I'm in the office, but I'm there, and I pick up my own phone. Um, communication is very important, critical to the process. 
you know, um, as I was talking to lots of people, right, Wendy, today? Didn't I give you a lot of free time today? You know? So um, I like to give a lot of free time away because as I was telling people, um, you're not going to hire someone unless you feel comfortable with their ability to understand and ad address the issues or to be able to provide value. And that's kind of one of the things that we try to do. Um, and does, does, does the outside uh, group have the required skill set? You know? And, you know, if they don't make, um, if their approach doesn't seem, you know, you have to ask yourself, do, does the approach that they're taking, does it seem to make sense? Does it have good, is it sound science? Does it seem to make good public policy? And is it sound regulatory policy? Um, are we willing to work on a budget, uh, pr prepare a project plan, you know, have deliverables, milestones, timelines? Those are all things that lawyers don't like to do or consultants don't like to do, but you really have to be disciplined to that whole process because uh, it can get very expensive very quickly. Uh, will they provide references? And are they team players and can you work with them? You really have to find some people that you really want to work with. Um, Make sure you get way hired. You know, um, I get a lot of people complaining when they hire CROs and things of that sort of monitors that they, they get sold like the first team and they get the second or third team coming in to do that and they don't get the uh, actual people that they really wanted to hire. Um, and do you, get, you know, do you get project status reports? You know, if you want to be updated you know, every week, you, know, you should get an update every week as to what's going on, for example, and things of that sort. Do you want to have a telephone call to talk about things? Uh, do they actually achieve the milestones or objectives that are set forth in, a pro in the project plan on a timely basis? You know, do, I, are, we, uh, are we meeting those within the appropriate time frames and on a particular budget? Some guiding principles. And I took this from our law firms. Uh, we have a, a pledge uh, that, uh, with respect to client service. And, you know, we have to understand clients' needs and business objectives, and we have to provide innovative and effective solutions tailored specifically to meet those needs, and we have to be responsible and available and recognize the evolving needs of clients. And that's very, very important in any service industry, and you should expect that from the people that you're working with, that's all. I mean, it's pretty common courtesy, but it's also uh, good words to live by. So I'm gonna end with two, two slides just on understanding the current climate at FDA. You heard a lot about what's going on, some of the choke points and things of that sort. And you've heard a lot about the safety issues that arise, and those are the things that make the news, okay? And so you see safety issues, you see fundamental challenges to the um, integrity of the approval process, and there's increased congressional scrutiny, public awareness, and criticism. And what happens at FDA when that, those things happen? You know, it's, you get more conservative decision-making, greater scrutiny of the data, they see consensus reviews, uh, it's increased focus on the FDA field inspections and things of that sort. And, you know, this user fee, you heard about the user fee situations, and that's putting a lot of time pressure on FDA to complete reviews in a timely fashion. And so the, the goal back in 1991 was that people wouldn't just issue a, a fail, you know, a complete response or a non-approvable letter because they were coming to the, uh, close to the end of the timeline, that they would utilize that as a way to appropriately communicate deficiencies or what was necessary to get the approval process. So, you know, the user fee uh, situation has been a success because it's provided a constant level of resources for FDA, but it also has put pressure on to complete the reviews in a timely manner, and some people just don't get it. They kind of just say, I'm just going to uh, not approve it because the t user fee timeline is coming up, and we're, I'm just going to clear this off my deck. That shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen with the reviews and with the supervisory process at FDA, but sometimes things get through the process. So um, what do I recommend? I like to go in early and often, okay? I want to know what FDA is expecting, okay? If you can meet FDA's expectations and it's reasonable, okay, it's a lot easier to get your product through the process if you kind of work with the agency. And I heard a, a few of our previous speakers talk a little bit about that. Um, you heard a lot about FDA guidance. It's guidance. It's all, it all says draft, not for implementation, okay? But it's FDA's best thinking about a particular topic. There are many ways to get there. It should provide a framework for you to think about what, how to meet those FDA requirements, but it's not the only way. And you can engage in scientific discussions and things of that sort through uh, a series of uh, pre-IND or pre-IDE types of meetings with the agency to get some feedback on your development plan, to get some concurrence on your development plan. Um, you can seek and obtain this guidance from FDA and outside experts and things of that sort. 
Now, the companies, that, and I know that for sure, the companies often understand their uh, products much more thoroughly than that of the FDA. And if you're thinking about it, they're sitting in this office in uh, now Silver Spring, Maryland, on a former naval uh, weapons uh, facility that they keep on digging up. I'm always afraid of where I walk over there. I don't walk on the grass, that's for sure. Uh, so we try to utilize uh, these process to try to educate FDA about our, proce our products. We really want to hear FDA's concerns. When we go to a meeting with FDA, we want to let them talk. We don't really talk a lot ourselves first. We kind of let them communicate and their responses to a package of information that we've sent on how we're going to develop our product. You never asked FDA, tell me what you want me to do. You always put forth a proposal and you always you know, uh, say, this is the protocol that I want to follow. Do you believe that this is acceptable to demonstrate that the product is safe or effective or things of that sort? And we try to respond. Now, FDA doesn't get it right all the time, okay? And um, if we're going to responsibly challenge FDA, you have to have good science and good regulatory and good legal positions and things of that sort. And you have to do it responsibly. The worst thing that happened to me on numerous occasions when I was at, when I was at FDA was they'd go, uh, I, we'd make a decision, we'd communicate the decision. Instead of coming back to talk to me, they'd go marching up to the commissioner's office and said, oh, David made a, a decision that I don't agree with. You know, why don't you come back and talk to us? You know, if you disagreed with us, we're certainly accessible to be able to, uh, to, to listen and, and open to uh, explore other ways to satisfy the FDA requirements. So I always end with this slide. You know, um, it's the miracle drug company. If it's a miracle, <laughs> if it works. Um, we got a nice try from the FDA. That's not what we're trying. We're not trying to get the nice try. We're trying to get the products approved uh, uh, to help uh, patients. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating. We really are looking forward to the discussion. And we'll take a lot of questions. Did you get any questions uh, via email yet? Okay, so why don't you, uh, you can do your spelling of your last name, that's for sure. Well, thank you again. Uh, Alan, I'm not sure if there was a slide that had my email. Um, okay, if we can get to that. Um, yeah. Sorry about this. I hope nobody's getting a. Okay, here we go. Yeah, those are good dog pictures. So, uh, if anybody has questions, uh, as as Brian steps up to um, facilitate the moderation portion, please uh, send those to the email address on the screen. You should see that in this room and in uh, uh, in the uh, overflow room. M Stoveken at wharf.org. It's M S T O V E K E N at wharf.org. Okay, thank you. Brian, I'm going to turn this over to you. So while well, Mark works the technologies, we're going to open the floor to questions. So uh, we'll go here first and then there. We have a, a microphone oh, coming yep, up. There, there you go. Oh, thank you. I'm Morris Waxler. Thanks for a great uh, talk, all three of you. A couple of comments uh, I'll talk about the, uh, and, and hello, I haven't seen you in quite a while. Um, it seems to me there's the, the uh, choke points um, are, I think, more integral to the agency. Uh, that is, uh, um, uh, as you know, I worked at the agency for a long time, uh, sort of contemporaneous with David. And uh, the, the choke points are um, part of the um, structure in the sense that you have a centralized uh, bureaucracy with a relatively small number of people. People think, most people think it's a lot of people because the numbers are fairly high. But given the number of products and the the vast uh, a range of products that are, are under FDA's jurisdiction, the number of folks within the agency are small, and they're also in separate groups, which doesn't facilitate communication. So immediately you have a choke point that's built into the, into the organization. And another comment about related to the choke points, and that is this whipsaw effect, which I saw it, and David and I experienced it in, in, in great uh, manner when we were at the agency. The, ch the whipsaw is because both things are correct. The agency gets things, uh, they, they are both slow on some things and they're too fast on other things. And partly it's a function of the, the, this choke point. 
There are many products, I know mostly the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. There are many products still within the agency that are very simple, that do not need to be anyone to look at them. They, they could not hurt anyone. They have a very low profile. So there's still a need to somehow get rid of that large group of products so that they're not, um, uh, I know there's, is there a question in this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was Please. wondering, yes. So I wish you would comment about how do we, uh, there's some thoughts about how one can uh, think about restructuring the agency uh, uh, so that um, so that there's m less of this sort of built-in um, uh, um, choke points that are a, a function of the the uh, limitations of a of a bureaucracy that can never be at the bench at the bedside of the patients because they're in their offices looking at the paperwork. Uh, so they can hardly ever be as educated as the folks that are submitting the documentation. So that's my question, one of them. Um, should I try? Yes, you should. <laughs> First, um, I would never disagree with you about the frustration that, in fact, both are true. The agency is both too slow and too fast in the context of drugs. And I'm going to focus again just on drugs for simplicity. Um, I would suggest that we are possibly at a moment in time where we might be able to change that. I think part of what has happened is that historically we have focused almost all of our attention on the pre-market period of time. And we try very hard through these phase one, two, three trials to learn what we need to learn before we let the drug out. But the reality is that people use drugs very differently now than they used to. They use more drugs at one time, they use them for longer periods of time. So it is simply not mathematically feasible to learn everything you need to know about a drug through these clinical trials before the market. You need to watch what happens when it goes out into the world. But historically as well, post-market, we've really lost complete control over the drugs. Very hard to know what's going on. And also there are a lot of legal problems that can dog you. Very difficult, for example, to restrict the speech of the sponsors when they want to market a drug because of commercial speech rules in the Constitution. Uh, there are perverse you know, anti-incentives to investment if they're not confident that once they're in the market, they're going to be able to stay on the market. But we do have a couple of things that are in our favor in what I think needs to be a fundamental switch in which our emphasis now is going to be on a much tighter, smaller, high-risk identification pre-market and then out into the market with a very robust post-market surveillance. The two things are the advent of electronic health records, which offers up the possibility of massive uh, computer analysis of health records from people from all kinds of circumstances using all kinds of drug combinations. But we're not there yet because the health records are not yet inter, they, they can't talk to one another yet. But that's, that's part one. Um, and I did have part two when I started this answer, but I have no idea what it was anymore. <laughs> um, but in the end, I think that what I'd like to see in an idealized world is for us to shift our attention to the post-market period. It would take, however, some change in the way we structure the economic incentives. Because companies would have to be willing to go and put in the money to invest in manufacturing quality, scaled up sales, knowing that there's a period of time in which they're going to be essentially in a conditional approval state where they might actually have to reduce the scale of their indications. I mean, this is a very big problem, but it's the only way that you could responsibly get stuff out early with the confidence that you could correct a problem as soon as it emerges. Thank you. Uh, all right, I have to comment, because I, okay. I just have to comment. Okay, I'm sorry, I just have to comment. So um, when I was at FDA, everybody complained about the drug lag. Okay, we were slow. Everybody was being, uh, products were being approved in Europe and a lot quicker than they were in the United States. We don't hear that. Okay. All we hear, though, is we hear the situation where, yeah, you let the product get out there, it had too much exposure, or you do a lot of second guessing when the products get into the market through the post marketing surveillance program. So I appreciate that post market surveillance is very, very important. We need to educate physicians and patients to make sure that if they do experience side effects and things like that, to appropriately report them. Very, very important. 
Um, I think the only way to really change the paradigm is to privatize the FDA or to change it. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about uh, having just a separate FDA at the cabinet level. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, it was talked about quite a bit uh, when I was there. Um, if you, you know, the whole thing about conditional approval and restricting the amount of drugs in the marketplace for the first two or three years mm -hmm. while we gain more experience. She didn't think of that. That's been coming, that's been, you know, that was 25 years ago that we thought about that sort of stuff too, that um, <laughs> FDA didn't want to do that. They really didn't want to do that. And I think there's pros and cons to doing that. Mm -hmm. Then you get into who gets those drugs, who gets access to those drugs. We can have a nice little ethical debate about that one too. But the people at FDA take their job very seriously. Okay, I can tell you that. I, I, you know, as a, as a we, I'm a, I, we are certainly we there, and the, it's incumbent upon us who are on the outside to provide high quality data sets and applications to FDA too. You want to help with the choke points? That's one of the best ways to do it, is to really kind of improve the quality of the submissions to FDA too. It, it, let me add one, just two things. First of all, I was not speaking on behalf of the agency. Second, I was in no way suggesting my ideas were original. Um, <laughs> but the third thing that people probably are not aware of, and maybe this is too much inside baseball, is that the FDA is hampered in its relationship with Congress in either making statutory changes or getting the funding it needs to have adequate personnel because for historical reasons, while the rest of HHS, the Health and Human Services Department, goes to the Health, Education, Labor Committee, FDA gets its funding through the Agriculture Committee because it started out as a food agency. And the ag people don't know squat about health or about FDA or about drugs or devices. And so it complicates the ability to work, you know, work constructively with Congress to correct these problems even within the current statutory frame. Yeah, I had a question for uh, the middle speaker about uh, international issues about regulation. I'm wondering, does the uh, existence now of multinational organizations like the IEEC as an example, does that facilitate the task of, uh, of international regulation in that it would apply more uniform standards to a group of countries instead of having to look at each country individually? Uh, I, I can say that it, it did at first. So, so there was an era where those sort of standards like IC, the big electrical one is the 60601, was accepted pretty much everywhere because everyone was first adopting it, so they all adopted the same version. And what has happened though since is that as the standards have evolved, the different countries have not updated which versions they accept. Most notoriously, China, right? There's still a version behind. Uh, but even Canada went before U.S. So you had to test now both versions of the standard. You have uh, double work. So it worked when it first when it first happened, but from there it's been a, a real confusion now. How do we all move together? And and I think some of the, that standard gamesmanship is to s sort of create a second. That people like the testing revenue. People like uh, that there's data going on that's just for them. They, so it's easier for them. So there's no reason for them to change. If I'm China and I just trained all my staff on addition two, why would I go to addition three? The, um, in, in the drug side, the International Conference of Harmonization has worked really hard to try to have one set of uniform standards that would be acceptable to regulatory bodies around the world. It's, it helps, but it's not 100 percent, that's for sure. So before we go there, we're going to do an email question for, uh, for the panel. Um, can you give us an estimate of cost for each class in the medical device for approval? Like the Just maybe a range. I say like the FDA fees, was it 4K for 510K? Yeah. 4,300 mm -hmm. bucks, yeah. 4, what, 200 something for a, I forget the exact number. And the consulting fees will be more. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right. All right. Um, this question here. And, and the PMA fee is in the millions of dollars, is, is over a million dollars yeah, for, for PMA, so it's very expensive. Um, not to beat on the FDA, but why not? Um, <laughs> there's 11,200 people, something like that. It's a small organization, relatively. Consent decree sites. Um, I have a slight concern. 
when a company gets into trouble with the FDA and one reads about consent decree and such and such companies enter into consent decree, FDA inevitably farms out their authority. So Quintiles Transnational, for instance, would be their expert, GMP expert. Does the panel feel that's reneging on authority? And I do know, obviously, the ultimate authority is, is the FDA. But 510K, a third party review of a 510K would be another example of that. So do you feel that's actually ethical, ethically OK? I'm going to let him start, because he, he worked in the council's office. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've also signed um, five consent decrees over the last two years, OK? And so um, I understand the issues that are associated with making high quality products and the response. I, I said that once already, the responsibility that manufacturers have to make high quality products. Do I have to, you know, if you're going to be in this business, you're in a highly regulated business. And if you're putting products in the market that don't meet standards of identity, strength, quality, and purity, okay, those are four words that were deeply ingrained into this young man's head right out of school when I went to work at FDA, and I take that very seriously, um, that you need, to, you need to understand and appreciate the quality requirements. Now, the FDA goes in and does a series of inspections, okay, and you get a chance to respond to those in inspections, and if you don't do a good job, you end up in a situation where you wind up into, in a consent decree, okay? So the FDA doesn't want to act as your consultant, and that's part of the pain that they extract from companies to make sure that they have the appropriate infrastructure in place to ensure that you can meet the quality standards on a day-to-day, batch-to-batch, year-to-year situation so that you can, un you can put out a quality product. And so they require companies to, it's a voluntary compliance system. It only works if the, if the companies themselves uh, understand and appreciate what's going on. You, the FDA can't be there at all, at all particular points in time. But, you know, it's, it's, there are 10, quinti 10 companies like Quintas that are out there that are serving to try to educate, understand, uh, build. It's not about money. It's about making sure that the companies fulfill their obligation to put out, have the infrastructure in place to put out quality products. Okay. Yeah, is it expensive? Oh, yeah. If you have to stop um, selling all your products, and you've got to recall all of your products, and you're just hemorrhaging money because you're paying the consultants and the lawyers a lot of money, it's very difficult because a lot of companies just don't have the wherewithal to survive a consent decree and to come back. Now, you know, I can talk a little bit about the Rambaxi consent decree because I signed that one too back in November, and as a condition of getting uh, the consent decree, they also gave them approval for a generic version of Lipitor, so, you know, um, they made a lot of money and they had a lot of capital to pay for the issues that they found in their Indian facilities. So it's still not, you know, it's still, the, it's a great responsibility that you all as manufacturers and, and companies have and you have to take it seriously and you have to make sure that you meet quality standards. You know, the problem is, is that quality standards differ from when you know, I look at it, you look at it, the next person looks at it, you get different levels of people at FDA looking at those situations, and it's not a, you know, current good manufacturing practices is not really, it's not a cookbook or anything like that, it's kind of like you know it when you see it, and so it's, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but there are fundamental practices, companies need to go out and hire some people to audit and to make sure that they're in compliance, and they need to continue to do that on a regular routine basis so that they have quality issues. I'm really... Uh, astounded at the number of uh, violative 483s and warning letters that are issued by FDA. And so um, I, you know, I really preach an ounce of prevention is, uh, and spending some money on in the infrastructure up front is much uh, well uh, better spent than paying a $500 million fine and then having to correct it on top of it too. So that's, you know, I get to preach a little bit too. That's kind of... <laughs> Uh, you know, please beg my indulgence, but uh, I take it very seriously. Thank you. Uh, let's try one more email question. Um, former Commissioner von Eschenbach recently recommended that Phase 3 be used exclusively for safety and Phase 4 for efficacy. Any reactions to that question? Who wants to dive in? I don't think that's a, 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 a reasonable way to, to go. I want, 
Uh, back in 1962, Congress put in the efficacy requirement for drugs for a particular reason. I want to make sure I want drugs. I want to make sure that I know that drugs work. Okay, and I want to know as a condition of approval that they work because the whole healthcare. I don't want people having you know getting exposed to products with that they may not have the appropriate. They don't meet. Uh, they may not meet the appropriate outcome measures. As uh, we heard that each drug is it's you know there are risks as well as benefits for each drug product and um, I don't want to I don't want to uh, expose people unnecessarily to, to risks. Yeah, I, I'd like to agree and explain one reason why. I think the word safety is used very differently by different people. To say a drug is safe is not to say that it has no side effects, no adverse events. To say a drug is safe is to say that the number of side effects, severity of side effects, the number of adverse events is reasonable as compared to the benefits. So if you have a 1 in 100,000 risk of a heart attack from a drug, and that's what you've learned from your phase 3 trial, but you don't know how effective it is, I don't know how you would decide whether it's safe or not, because 1 in 100,000 may be too much if what you're talking about is something that is a mild headache reliever, and it might be perfectly acceptable if it's a chemotherapy. So I don't see how you could possibly do what this uh, writer described as von Eschenbach's suggestion. I do, however, take uh, Commissioner von Eschenbach's suggestion is not being exactly that, but really also going on in the vein of the dialogue we had before about how, how is it possible that we can actually begin to um, limit our expectations for what we can learn in phase three to something that is more reasonable in terms of the amount of money and time that companies can realistically spend, and then at the same time ratchet up what we do after marketing in a way that assures the public that we are not missing something important and that we're able to react quickly when we do find something that we hadn't expected. Thank you. So in the interest of time in the social hour, we're going to take one last question. And I'll, there, right here. Uh, the mic's coming down. Thank you for the privilege of the last question. <laughs> I'll direct this to uh, Professor uh, Charo. In your introductory comments, you said something about exclusivity in marketing. Now, obviously, if my company is the only one that has received uh, pre-market authorization or 510K, uh, then I'm the only one that can sell it. Are you talking about some kind of exclusivity above and beyond that? Yeah. There, if you are the owner of a patent, obviously, you have now the ability to exclude others. But there is a separate form of exclusivity that is granted in the drug arena if you approach the agency and you are the one who provides the underlying data that proves that this particular drug is uh, safe and effective for this particular indication. At that point, regardless of whether you have a patent or not, you are now granted the exclusive right to market that drug for that purpose for a limited period of time, a number of years, which gives you a real market advantage. Now, um, some of you may remember a number of years ago in the area of antihistamines. There were a number of companies that were all making antihistamines that operate against, frankly, all the different things. You know, the, the, the grasses and the trees and the, the dust and the mites and the whole nine yards. Uh, and they were all equally effective or ineffective against animals. But there was only one company that actually had gone to the FDA with its data uh, to prove that it had X effectiveness against animals and so was given the exclusive right to market for that purpose. And I remember the ad. It was very misleading to consumers, but this was the point. It showed a little house and grass and trees and mites and dogs and cats, and it said, these five antihistamines will all help you with this. And it takes away the tree, it takes away the, you know, the, the grass, and then it takes away the mites. But then it says, but only one has been approved by the FDA to protect you against allergies from your cats and dogs. Now, that's very misleading because, in fact, all of them would be equally effective, but only one company had put in the investment to prove that fact. And that's a very valuable kind of exclusivity for some purposes and some drugs. And that is what you can get in the drug arena. The, the rules are a little different in medical devices and in, you know, foods is an entirely different area, but for drugs, that would be the advantage. Sure. I mean, so on the, on the device side, a 510K actually is practically no exclusivity. And, and it's not viewed as if you go to a 510K, you can pretty much count on a competitor will follow very shortly because they're very inexpensive if the application is worth, worth getting. And that happens between the big scanner manufacturers all the time. Now, PMA offers some protection because it is so expensive, and you have to produce your same evidence that it works, and it's a valid clinical use, and it's, a, and it's safe. But for a 510K, where most people are, um, as soon as you get that claim, the other guy now can piggyback on your claim. And they'll just, they'll just submit and say, yeah, we do that too. And, uh, 
and for them it's just three months in, in review and maybe another three months to prepare the application. This, by the way, is one of the things that's been holding up so-called personalized medicine because diagnostics are considered devices. And so uh, there's not as much incentive as there would be in the drug arena for a company that manufactures a diagnostic to go through the effort to get it formally approved by the FDA if they can evade that through a lab test formulation since as soon as they do get an approval from the FDA, unless it was a PMA, right? Yeah. As soon as they got the approval, every other company that wanted to copy that test would be able to do so without any economic penalty. There's the potential to get patent term extension on any of those types of things. Under the Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act, Congress struck a balance. So they gave incentives to drug companies to research and develop new drugs. So we have a period of five years of new chemical entity exclusivity for a, a new chemical entity that's submitted, or three years for, of market exclusivity for the, the cat hay fever that the only one, uh, mm -hmm. the only one company can um, particularly um, uh, advertise and promote doesn't pr stop other people from promoting for other indications, but they can only uh, advertise and promote the, the one company that has the exclusivity can only advertise and promote uh, the one that's, um, that they have the exclusivity for. Um, and it doesn't, you're right, on the device side, it's, it's very different, but there's patent protection, and so that's what we, you know, that's the only thing you can use on the device side is, is the fact that you, you have a patent and you, you can enforce it against others. So before we break for the uh, social event, please thank the uh, speakers again for their...